Okay, sir, we'll start now. Yes, you can start. Yes. So, welcome back to all of you. Let's quickly recap what we did. So, we said if you want to build a cryptocurrency, we need crystal signatures for letting people know who is the current owner. And then to transfer ownership, you need the chain property for the double spending not to happen. When the chain property is broken in the hash chain, you cannot say who is the current owner. To get back the chain property, somebody has to choose the actual chain from multiple chains that are possible. Who is that somebody? So in a centralized system, you could have a trusted entity. In a decentralized system, you run an agreement protocol in the P2P network to actually agree on the chain that you want to choose. So how do you run the agreement protocol? We saw one solution so far, so called the Byzantine agreement protocol, where you, you let everybody send all that they received in the previous round to everybody else in the next round. If you run for, if you do this algorithm for T plus one rounds, you can, uh, you can tolerate up to T faults. However, uh, the complexity of the protocol will be, Communication complexity will be n to the power t plus one. The round complexity will be t plus one, and this works only when n is greater than three t. It works only when you actually know who are all these the people in the network, and it it works when there is some sort of synchrony so that you can run round by round protocols. So there are all these drawbacks. Uh, first drawback that we will try to remove using cryptography is we bring in signatures again to actually say we can improve the fault tolerance, not just when uh, n is greater than 3t, but for all t. So this is called authenticated Byzantine agreement. So where we ask people to sign the message uh, before sending, and therefore we can localize the faults unless, uh, uh, say, uh, whenever there's a contradiction between the sender and receiver, uh, the rest of the network can, can actually find out who is faulty and eliminate the faulty person. And therefore the best thing to do for the adversary is is uh, to to say that he has not received anything rather than saying he has he has received a wrong value in which case he has to give the signature of the sender and in which case he will get caught and therefore the worst case behavior uh, uh, that is the best for the adversary the worst for the network is when the adversary is very shrewd and says he hasn't received anything so so basically Byzantine fault is now uh, as good as Fail stop or crash falls and and therefore t plus one rounds are still necessary. However, there is an authenticated Byzantine agreement protocol which works when when n is uh, greater than t rather than n is greater than three t. So no matter how many faults are there, n is greater than t. No matter how many faults are there, as long as there is one honest person, the protocol works. So that is a great news for for high levels of fault tolerance. But this protocol also everybody sends the message. To everybody else and whatever they received in their in the previous round they have to send to everybody else you have to do this for t plus one rounds the complexity is is n to power uh, t plus one all right but t can be very large that's not an issue so one drawback is removed by signatures uh, however other drawbacks namely you you need a fully connected network you you need some sort of synchrony you need uh, high communication uh, bandwidth you need T plus one rounds, all this is still there. So for one out of three, this is the protocol. So we won't go into the details because we have we have a lot of things to learn about blockchains, which are well and truly beyond the uh, cryptography and distributed computing. It brings in game theory aspects. So, so let's look at. Suppose I I want to agree on on the. Uh, correct chain, I could run a Byzantine agreement protocol. In case the faults are very high, you could run an authenticated Byzantine agreement protocol. But none of these are uh, going to work in open systems. Open systems in the sense you do not even know who are all part of the agreement or need to be part of the agreement. So you have a lot of parties in the system. All the parties have to agree, but nobody knows the list of all the parties. So, so you cannot actually send your message to everybody in the sense that you do not know who are there uh, and it is not a completely connected system and therefore you cannot directly contact every person uh, and possibly you do not even want to run t plus one but you know, that's not the issue you know open system uh, uh, things get murky outright because you just do not know who are all there 
so how do you make people agree on on uh, the chain that works or the chain that is to be extended and used in an open system is what blockchain addresses so this will bring in a third field other than so original distributed computing things were impossible uh, in certain settings you bring in digital signatures and uh, you can you can get solutions for my coin but they would not work for the double spending problem you actually make the system agree on the correct chain and for that agreement you bring in again use digital signatures get authenticated by an agreement all that is well and fine in a closed system and like in a permission blockchain for instance where you know who are all part of your agreement protocol but in a public blockchain where where the, it's not permissioned any, anybody can join the system and nobody has any idea who are all there how do you actually decentralize and how, how do you how do you say how do you have a trustworthy mechanism to pick uh, the chain back when the chain property disappears how to get it back so that is what we will see i will see not only you'll see a, a pleasing solution for that using game theory apart from distributed computing and cryptography we will also look at uh, how do you extend this in many different ways in the future and what kind of problems in the future will be solved by this approach that's towards the end actually so let's see the blockchain approach what is the approach so approach is essentially bring in a third field called game theory which actually simplifies the whole thing so we all already saw that you want you don't want to keep the history secret and to make the game theory work we add the following point you the person who is adding to the system is of course not not trustworthy all right but the point here is is randomly picked and why should he be randomly picked how is he randomly picked depends on the solution so bitcoin picks it randomly in different way ethereum picks it randomly in different way algorand picks in random different way so different coins will pick them in randomly but the approach is there should be no monopoly in the person who adds the new block and the person who adds the new block should be randomly picked it, it should not be the same person adding and it need not even be the person who is doing the transaction adding so the person who is adding let us let us call him the miner the miner is randomly picked how do you pick it randomly so separate protocol will not worry about that in this slide that will be in the next few slides but notice that if you we want that property and why do you need this non monopoly property it will be clear by the time we finish this slide itself and finish the blockchain approach the blockchain approach is step one you don't let any monopoly to creep in nobody feels that he or she will get uh, opportunity to add very very frequently you get your opportunity to act as a, as a, a person who will, will be actually adding to the uh, system or adding to the chain you get opportunity once in a blue moon that is the uh, reason why you are you are picking randomly because now as the size grows your your chances of being chosen reduces because you are randomly picked so as the size grows your chances of monopoly should come down now if the size is very small of course even if you randomly pick you will have monopoly in this uh, system and therefore the trust will be lower but as the size grows uh, the mechanism should be such that you your opportunity to be chosen as the designated person to add actually comes down and uh, comes down so much that it will actually increase the trust let us see how how that happens but to begin with and uh, be on the same page as me that this property suppose you are able to get somehow let us see how to get it later so suppose you get this property somehow then let us see what is the problem that is left to be solved so all double spends are detected because you can see that same coin you can see that it is not a chain basically however there is no centralized authority to correct it and this is all same as what you saw earlier so all the pairs have to agree on the correct chain the question is how now the randomly picking thing is is not going to directly affect this but indirectly is going to affect in a beautiful way let us see what so how do you make people agree 
Of course, you can run a Byzantine agreement protocol in a closed system if you know who are all the peers. In an open system where you do not even know who are all the peers, how do you make all the peers agree on the correct chain? So the idea is the following. Get the following uh, points right with game theory and, and we got the understanding of what is the blockchain approach. How do you know what is uh, the correct chain? So the longest chain is just deemed to be correct. And that's about it. But how do we know there is only one longest chain and how do we know that shorter chains will, will uh, not eventually become longer than the longest chain and confuse the entire system and how do you know it will be stable and how do you know in the equilibrium there will be one and uniquely one longest chain. So, so that is the uh, need. So there is no way to guarantee this. Therefore, we bring in a new field called game theory to guarantee sort of probabilistically or game theoretically guarantee that the longest chain will be unique and uh, it will be only one and therefore the chain property is intact and you can use it as a cryptocurrency. So how do you make this happen using game theory? We give two more uh, requirements. So two more requirements apart from the first one we read that you should be randomly picked. The person who is adding, appending should be randomly picked. Second property we want is the appending to the longest chain is to be rewarded. Third property we want is appending elsewhere, that is appending in, in the non-longest chain should be penalized. Okay, so now read the three requirements and also the point that agree on the longest chain. It will be clear to you in, in a common game theoretic sense that this will work. So I'll read it together and you can see why. You get an opportunity once in a blue moon. If you add to the longest chain, you will collect a reward. If you add in anywhere else, you will have, you will, you will, you have to pay a penalty. Now, if you read, if you have such a system, everybody and anybody who is getting an opportunity once in a blue moon will add to the longest chain, make it even more longer, take the reward and go away. Where it is irrational to think that a person who is who uh, is going to get a chance once in a blue moon will will take the uh, opportunity to add in the wrong place and get penalized because. If we, if there are some monopoly, there is at least some control, and he can keep adding to a shorter chain and eventually hope that it will become longer and build his story. However, he knows that he is not going to get a chance uh, till next year or next next year. He's going to be randomly picked. So by which time the longest chain would be so long that the chain that he is interested in to make longer, he would have added one block there, paid some penalty and and that's about it and the longest chain became too long by the time he got another opportunity so so it is completely irrational for a person to actually uh, add or append anywhere else but to the longest chain because he's getting a chance once in a blue moon so when randomness meets reward for adding to the longest chain meets penalty for adding anywhere else meets the fact that you can just pick the longest chain as the correct one this is called the blockchain approach if you if you do this you can actually make people or peer to peer systems agree on on stuff essentially agree on the longest chain and ensure that things will not go awry ever because you are you are going to be picked once in a blue moon and you are rewarding if you add to the longest chain and penalizing if you add anywhere else so Let's see how how you get these three in say bitcoins. How do you do the random selection of who should add next? How do you incentivize uh, or give reward for adding to the longest chain? And how do you give penalties for adding as well? Now notice that we could have run three different protocols for this. So I would have run a random selection protocol. I could have said the incentivization protocol and the penalty protocol. So I could have done that also. There are times we should do that also, but the pleasingness in the solution also arises us in, uh, in uh, Bitcoins from the way you get these three things done with something called proof of work. So let us see what, what that is and it will be clear that it has some level of random selection, it has incentives and some level of penalty. So game theory should start to kick in and you can just make the system agree on the longest chain. Uh, let us see what, what is proof of work, sir. Instead of saying that the person who can who can add next is a person just chosen just like that we will say the for the person or minor to be eligible to add he should give proof that that he did a lot of work 
that is spent a lot, lot of energy uh, uh, power bill and other things suppose you say this then notice that automatically there is penalty for everybody whether you add to the longest chain or add anywhere else there is uniform penalty everywhere and therefore the penalty is taken care of the penalty is you are giving proof of work for you to be eligible to add and the proof of work means you actually worked you actually worked means you actually spent a lot of energy and you have to pay your energy bill so so if you are able to give proof of work in some way you, in which way you will get penalty we will we'll see how, how to give proof of work to also get random selection right so to begin with let us say we ask for proof of work and uh, proof of work no matter how what work that is it will automatically give penalty now is proof of work the only way to give penalty not necessarily you can you can directly collect penalties that uh, notice that proof of work is uh, going to give you random selection and penalty together so it is interesting but if you split the protocols you can collect penalty even without proof of work and so on but but notice that let us focus on how, how bitcoin works so i'll look at proof of work first and understand it in depth so you have to give proof of some work what work let's see what kind of work that is but before that how do you get the incentive because you are, everybody is paying penalty suppose you are giving reward if you add to the longest chain and the reward is greater than the penalty much much greater than the penalty let us say then automatically there is net net of net there is a reward for adding to the longest chain there is penalty for adding to other places if you add to other places there is no reward there is only penalty if you add to the longest chain there is penalty and reward but reward is much greater than penalty and and therefore yeah, net is there is only reward so in bitcoin it is it is a cryptocurrency by itself and therefore giving reward is very straightforward you can just say uh, collect transaction fees or are also say pay you from thin air so create new bitcoins and put it in your wallet so, so getting reward in a cryptocurrency is fairly straightforward therefore uh, as the value of the reward or uh, each coin is is uh, higher and higher it is it is more and more rewarding that that you will give more or you will be ready to actually take uh, take care of more and more penalty so in incentive for adding in the longest chain is straightforward penalty for adding in very simply you have to give proof of work how do you get random selection now here's where things get very interesting if the proof of work that is going to give penalty is the work is actually of a special kind it it also entails random choice so so what is the special kind of work so we said the hash of every block should be stored in the next block now if if the if the each block is is given additional uh, field called nonce and said you are free to change the nonce such that the hash right is to be less than some threshold then there is a lot of work that you have to do and that becomes proof of work why you have to do a lot of work you have to keep changing the nonce and computing the hash and checking whether the hash is less than the threshold or not so that's called the hash puzzle so you have to solve the hash puzzle in the sense the hash should be less than a threshold you do you do whatever change you want to the nonce field of the previous block such so that the uh, the uh, uh, thing gets less than the threshold now previous block here could be the block you are mining at the time so that becomes the previous block for the next one so the hash of the block that that you are mining should be less than uh, the the uh, threshold so for which you have to do a lot of work and if the threshold is high enough but not low enough that it is going to give at least about 10 minutes of work for the entire computation in of the planet to actually solve it then bitcoin says we are happy so that level of work is enough so every 10 minutes my one mining will be done because in 10 minutes you can solve the hash puzzle so so what is hash puzzle so you have a hashing function and the, your, the hash value should be less than the threshold so for instance you're using sha1 is a hash function the output is 160 bits suppose you say it should be less than 2 power uh, uh, 130 uh, something like you should start with 30 zeros so it should start with 30 zeros Th that would mean that you keep doing it about uh, brute, brute force search for about 2 power 30 and that takes about 10 minutes let's say now, if, if, if it takes less than 10 minutes make the puzzle harder if it takes greater make the puzzle easier so how do you make puzzle harder or easier to make it harder you just reduce the threshold that's all so you make it easier increase the threshold so so notice that if you have a hash puzzle then you can actually double it up as proof of work because you have to do a lot of work to solve the hash puzzle you can also double it up as a random choice because the first person who wins is going to 
add and the definition of previous block will change as soon as the next block is added and therefore the people have to restart the computation. So essentially the first person is going to win. And who is the first person? Now given that the hash puzzle is solved by random nonce, nobody knows before and who's going to win. So therefore the person who's, who has won this puzzle is sort of giving us non-monopoly. It's giving us the random selection and put together you have enough randomness in your selection you have enough incentive to add the longest chain. You have enough penalty to uh, for adding elsewhere. And and when all these three meet, game theory says you just can agree on the longest chain, and that's about it. So this is proof of work. So now uh, let us see. Approach is spelling this wrong. D P P R O O A S E. Okay. So uh, we'll correct this mistake, uh, we'll leave this spelling. So we'll look at other approaches for, for uh, the same end. So as, as we said, the approach is not proof of work. The approach is there should be non-monopoly, that is there should be randomness in the pers uh, 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 person who's minor who's winning the race to add. There should be incentive for adding in the longest chain and there should be penalty for adding somewhere else. Then you can choose the longest chain and agree on it. So let us look at some other solutions other than proof of work, which actually gets uh, all these three in different proportions. So proof of work is is uh, getting enough from uh, adequate randomness because who wins the race is the person who uh, who has a lot of computation. Uh, he will be likely to win the race, but in uh, the fraction of computation that you can control in the overall set of computation of the world as the size grows. It is sort of random. Uh, it may not be, but assuming it is it is random, you you get enough randomness. If it is not, you don't get. But randomness is related to the amount of uh, distribution of of the computational power. So it is not randomly selected. It is selected based on your computational power, which is is adequately random. Let us say in most settings. So you get some randomness from there. It's not truly random. You could have done better than uh, uh, proof of work uh, style of random, which is depending on the computation power distribution. You could actually have selected randomly and that algorithm does. So there are protocols which does that also, but there is enough randomness to have non monopoly let us say. And then there is enough reward because of the value of the Bitcoins. You can, you can give something for free or take transaction fees. And there is enough penalty because you, you, if you lose, and uh, you, you you do lose more often than win because you only the first person who starts the person gets to add. So if you lose, I uh, you have to still pay your bills. And if you don't uh, try at all, you you're you're uh, as good as not participating in the system. And even if you win once in a while, you anyway have to pay your energy bill for all the triggers you made, whether you win or not. So there is penalty whether or not you you uh, uh, say add in the right place or wrong place. So the person who's who's winning could actually choose a wrong chain and add, he still has to play the energy bill because wherever you add, you have to give the proof of work for you for it to be accepted. All right, so that is about proof of work. Now let us see what is proof of stake. So proof of stake says that the person who adds the next block is not picked by making everyone solve a hash puzzle. It's not picked by saying the hash value should be less than threshold and the first person who gets that will, will get to add. It's not picked that way. But the next person is picked by choosing the owner of a random coin and saying this owner will, will add. So we just pick a random coin and the owner of the random coin will be chosen as a person to to add the next block. So notice that it re reduces a lot of environmental effects of uh, mining in the proof of work because of the nature of, uh, of the work they are doing. A lot of people are doing a lot of wasted work and so much work is being wasted that it, it creates po possibly some sort of global warming because, because there is a lot of wasted work. Uh, and more environment friendly would be if you can, can do the picking without having to waste so much work and you know what you need. You need the randomness property, the reward property, penalty property. So if you want to get this property, you could get it through any which way. 
So let us see how proof of stake gets it. Proof of stake says I will get the randomness property by just picking a random coin and saying who's the owner of this picked coin is supposed to have. Now, why is it called proof of stake? The notice that if I pick a random coin from a chain, the probability that I'll I'll pick the owner depends on how much you own. The more you own, the higher the probability that you will be the owner of the random coin. If you own the entire coin, the probability that you will be the owner of any random coin is one. If you if you all own 50% of the entire uh, uh, system of coins, you pick a random coin with probability half, it you will be the owner. So depending on how much stake you have, the randomness is uh, going to be that much. So if you, the more the stake you have, the less the random it is. The more the stake, more monopoly will be in the system. So that's called proof of stake. So that's that's the name. Notice that in the proof of work, the more computational power you have. The uh, less monopoly, uh, so uh, the less monopoly, the more sorry, the more monopoly, more the stake you have, you can you will be chosen again and again. In proof of stake, the more the stake you have, will be chosen again and again because you're picking a random coin, and if you have won almost all coins, you will be picked, you will be the owner of the random coin that is picked again and again. In proof of work, if you won a lot of computational power, you will solve the hash puzzle before everybody else, and you will be picked again and again. All right. So for for the randomness to be there and and therefore non-monopoly property should to be there in proof of work we do not want any concentration of computational power and in proof of stake we do not want any concentration of of the stake. However, in case there is concentration of power, the monopoly property goes away and and that create, could create some trouble. And in case there is too much ownership by somebody, the stake property could be that could create some trouble. But let us understand uh, in the proof of stake, how do we get randomness? We get randomness because we pick a random coin and, and uh, it depends on the stake, but it also ensures that penalty is, is inbuilt because the possibility that a randomly picked coin is owned by a person increases with the stake and the person who's owning more stake will have uh, more chances of getting picked. And once a person gets picked because of his stake, notice that his stake is whatever he owns in that chain so far, the longest chain so far. Now, because he owns a lot of coins in the longest chain, it is very likely that he may not own that many coins in the other shorter chains. In the current longest chain, he owns a lot of coins because he got a lot of rewards in the longest chain, possibly. And therefore, he, he or she owns a lot of coins in the longest chain. Once you own a lot of coins in the longest chain, you wouldn't possibly be owning much in shorter chains. Therefore, automatically there is penalty to add to the shorter chain because if you add to the shorter chain and make it longest, you will lose all the gains you got in the longest chain. Since you lose all the gains you got in the longest chain, there is an inbuilt penalty to keep the longest chain long. Uh, and uh, if you if you may want to make a shorter chain long, then you lose all the gains you got in the current chain, right? So, so the penalty is, is also there because of the skin in the game. And uh, incentives is the same. It is like transaction fees or for rewards for mining. So this is proof of stake for you. So notice that uh, like proof of work gets randomness and penalty by penalty by energy bill payment and randomness by the first person who solved the puzzle. Uh, proof of stake gets penalty by the skin in the game because you, you have uh, all your coins you built, all your coins you built in the current chain, and if you if you make, uh, choose to make some other chain longer than the current chain, you will you, you will be the loser, and the person who is having more coins in the chain is likely to pick more frequently, and therefore he'll have even more penalty uh, when he, when he tries to make something else longer, and that is how proof of stake works. So so let us see other kinds of of uh, Proof of X. So there is a delegated proof of stake. So this is uh, bringing in democracy within the proof of stake. So pure democracy, of course, does not work because uh, it does not have penalty. So you, you, for instance, you you may have random choice. You may you may say you vote and elect your government that has some random choice property. All right. Yeah, it may have penalty. Uh, 
forced into it, no problem. But but notice that for the right behavior, there is there is no reward. So and for the wrong behavior, there is no penalty. So the elected uh, party can do whatever it, it wants. There is there is uh, no uh, right penalty and uh, reward system. And therefore, pure democracy would not work. Let us see what kind of democracy is there. So it's called delegated proof of stake. So the person who is who's, uh, to be uh, chosen is, is voted. And instead of giving one vote per user, you are giving one vote per coin. And therefore, person, rich people here in this will have more skin in the game, they'll have more coins and they'll have more voting power. And therefore, there is democracy in the sense you are you are voting to power, but there is still skin in the game. Therefore, there is penalty because the person who is going to be chosen uh, or voted through is going to be because of people who have more coins. Because there's one vote per coin and people who have more coins will, will sway the system. And therefore, they will have more more say in uh, in who is going to win. And therefore, the person who's who's winning is likely to be backed by people who have more more skin in the game in that chain. And therefore, he's he or she is likely to add to that chain because adding elsewhere will be derogatory to the gains of the people who have more stake in this particular chain. So, if you have more gains in a particular chain, you want to you know, that to remain the longest chain because if you make some other chain longer, you lose all the rewards you got in this chain, right? Therefore, that is delegated proof of stake, right? So where does randomness get uh, incorporated in delegated proof of stake? It is it is uh, weaker than proof of work and proof of stake because randomness is only because of the choices uh, that you have. So if, if there are not many people who are standing for the election, the randomness won't be there. If there are even say few people standing for election, it, it will be still weak because uh, the total number of uh, nonsense you have to try to and total number of coins that is there from where you have to pick is still way more than than uh, total number of people who will, who will be there for your election right so so in, randomness is weaker but still it is there and penalty is again by the skin in the game uh, it's not direct skin in the game it is skin in the game because uh, you are you are going to be uh, voting for a representative who is representing people who have higher skin in the game right Rewards is the same. So this is how delegated proof of stake works. So there is a proof of burn. So so notice that I, I'm not there. The proof of X, the X can be many, many things. There are there are scores of things which have been proposed. I'm, I'm not uh, actually purporting to, to list all of them and explain all of them here. I am just choosing the top uh, half a dozen or so uh, proof of X concepts. And uh, the idea is to actually ensure that once you know how to get randomness, how to get the penalty, how to get the reward in various ways, you can create your own proof of X. There is no need to actually use what is there around or uh, even depend on that because you know what is the requirement of the system for it to work. The requirement is non-monopoly, first requirement. Second is incentive for, for, for the right behavior that is adding in the longest chain. Third is penalty for the wrong behavior. That is uh, not, I mean, adding elsewhere, it should be painless other than the longest chain and then you just agree on the longest chain and you got your chain property and your currency will run so what should be the proof of x what is the x you can you you can try such that you get all these three properties intact so what is proof of burn the idea is the miner should give proof that they burned some coins and what do you mean burn some coins uh, easiest way to burn a coin is to send it to a dead address so so send create a a, a dead address which is only allowed to take in coins and but never give out the coins and that is as good as giving a proof that you have burned the coin by by showing that i have paid my coin to the dead address and therefore i have burnt my coin so therefore clearly the person who, who burned the highest number of coins will be the person who is chosen in that case you get Randomness, uh, because different people will have different tendency to burn, and therefore, who is going to burn more depends on the whims and fancies of of the people at that time. So, so however, notice that person who burns, burns the most is the person who is chosen, and therefore, there is penalty by loss of coins directly. So here, penalty is the highest. You directly work with penalty. So, 
So in proof of one penalty is the main thing and rest of the follows in, in proof of work. Uh, you, uh, the also you find that energy, the penalty is the main thing, but also the uh, randomness is the main thing and and uh, yeah, it also works. Uh, the proof of burn case, if you uh, see deeply, the person who burnt more coins is going to get a chance and person who burnt more coins has to get back that uh, immediately otherwise to get chance again he has to burn even more coins in the next one and and therefore he wants to get rewards for it and he uh, therefore yeah, any rational behavior would say he will add to the longest chain collect the reward and then try again now uh, notice that randomness is weak here because uh, rich people have tendency to burn more coins so similarly uh, like proof of stake so so randomness is highest in proof of work very clearly uh, rest of things is slightly more uh, 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 monopolies allowed. However, because of this higher penalty and more direct penalty and skin in the game, uh, it, it is it is working. So other, other things are leaning more towards penalty, less towards randomness. Proof of work is uh, clean slate. It has adequate amount of randomness and penalty and reward is the same for all. So practical percent and fault transfer mechanism. So in case it's a closed system, then you don't need it the proof of work because you know who are all to be part of the agreement and therefore you could run the agreement protocol and this agreement protocol you, you can you can do it for t plus one rounds as, as usual and, and that is next one so there is a, a strategy called proof of elapsed time so each participant is allowed to wait for a random amount of time and the first participant who finished waiting gets to add a new block here randomness is there because of the random wait in the time however how do you actually prove that you you waited so randomness is highest if you are able to give a proof but so far there is no proof of uh, elapsed time in in software there is a proof of elapsed time in, in some tamper resistant hardware but if you trust the hardware then you may as well not even worry about uh, anything else you can use that hardware to actually pick the chain itself so the randomness is weak today but in principle it is very strong because uh, if you can truly make them wait for a random amount of time, it is really very strong. Penalty is 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 uh, absent in proof of elapsed time, so are, are very weak. So, so uh, what is the penalty in in adding? So there is no monopoly, all right, but then there is uh, no penalty, but there is a reward. So so uh, game theoretically, because there is a reward and you get a chance once in a blue moon, you may still add to the longest chain, but there is no direct penalty for adding anywhere. So this is weak in that sense also. So let us so summarize what we have done. So, so we saw currently how several proof of X works and how practical version agreement protocol works. And and how it how the blockchain approach works so blockchain approach is is clear now given that the blockchain approach is clear so let us move ahead to the future so i look at uh, future based on quantum mechanics for example and and uh, i'll also see future of the problems that we can solve so yeah, how does quantum mechanics help in this uh, whole approach so we can see that quantum computer can break RSA and therefore more than help it can play havoc with the current systems. It can break the current signature schemes. It can uh, actually uh, uh, break the current Bitcoin for sure. And therefore quantum computers will uh, rather than make uh, uh, blockchains today play more uh, spoil sport role. However, in the future, uh, you could have quantum mechanics enabled to blockchains uh, which probably we'll see how quantum mechanics can help us in achieving consensus itself directly. So, so the rest of the few slides, I'll show you how quantum mechanics can help you in quantum uh, Byzantine agreement and therefore directly help in, in blockchains of the future. So for which you need to know some amount of quantum mechanics, I'll introduce just enough amount of quantum mechanics so that we can quickly see how do we understand how building quantum Bayesian and agreement protocols? So, so we start with the experiment with, with three pole raisers. So the experiment is this, if you have a horizontal pole raiser A, about 50% of the intensity of light is visible on the screen. So about 50% of photons pass through horizontal pole raiser. 
If you have a horizontal pole tracer followed by a vertical pole tracer, they observed that no photons pass through. Whereas if you have a horizontal pole tracer followed by a 45 degree pole tracer, then followed by a vertical pole tracer, about one eighth of the photons pass through. This is what is uh, people uh, observe. And this observation was so bizarre that they, it required a new kind of mathematics to model the reality or model nature. And that new kind of mathematics is what today we call as quantum mechanics. Today, in the sense, we have been calling it since about 100 years. So why is it bizarre? You can quickly see that the flow of any commodity that is stopped by two filters cannot be reignited uh, by a third filter in between those two in any monotone kind of classical thinking. So in the classical thinking, it's all monotone. If two filters can stop the flow of water, or two dams can stop, stop the flow of water, the third dam cannot cannot reignite the flow. If uh, you say uh, two membranes can stop the flow of, of milk, then a third membrane in between those two cannot reignite the flow. So if two two if two uh, membranes are or filters are sufficient to block, then three are more than sufficient to block. So this is what we call monotone thinking, and all classical thinking is monotone. So if, if you already have information A and C, if you have A, B, and C, you, you should have more information than you have A and B. So information cannot be destroyed by adding information. So, so that is the monotone thinking. And uh, quantum mechanics says that is not true. Even in quantum information, it is not true. You can destroy information by the presence of additional information is, is, is the most bizarre effect of quantum mechanics, but to explain it, we need to understand quantum superposition, which in turn will give us entanglement, which in turn will give us quantum uh, computer in general, but we'll, we, our focus is on quantum agreement or quantum computers. Now, when I first look, look at this experiment, it is so bizarre that I thought it may not be uh, uh, easily believable. Fortunately for us, there is a YouTube video which actually records this and, and I'll play that video for you. So you can see for yourself. So 50% of photons for horizontal and vertical. Horizontal followed by vertical blocks flow completely. Now, Carefully watch when it is placed at angle between horizontal and vertical. It's getting some flow of photons. Two filters can block it, but uh, three filters cannot block. Passwording for you. We have seen your so we need to have an explanation for this. And quantum mechanics is one such explanation. It explains based on superposition principle. What is JSS associated with any quantum system is a state vector in Hilbert space. So what does it mean in real life? It means if you have some possible outcomes, then a superposition of all possible outcomes is the reality before you measure. So before you measure, it should be superposition of all. So for instance, for qubits, there are two possible outcomes. So it can either pass through or not pass through the filter, for instance. Then before you measure, it is in the superposition of A times passing through plus B times not passing through. So A times zero plus B times one, let us say. Where A and B are complex numbers, where mod square plus mod base square is one, with the physical interpretation that if you measure it, it will collapse, you will get zero with probability mod A square and the system will collapse to zero. And if you, if you, with probability mod B square, you will get one and the system will collapse to one. Right? So, 
with this postulates, you can actually predict the outcome of the photon experiment in this model, and you can actually predict for every experiment conducted so far. Let us see how. So initially, it is A times passing through vertical plus B times passing through horizontal, right? So mod A square is the probability that it passes through vertical. So about 50% of the chance is there because mod A square plus mod B square is one. So mod A square expected is 50%. So about 50% of light passes through horizontal, 50% of light passes through vertical. But once it passes through vertical, it becomes vertical. So it, it becomes 1 times vertical plus 0 times horizontal. So then probability of passing through horizontal is 0. So nothing passes through those two. However, if you have a 45 degree in, in the middle, so once it passes through vertical, it collapses to vertical. Now vertical can be written as 1 by root 2 times passing through 45 plus 1 by root 2 times passing through 135. So 1 by root 2 square is uh, half. So 50% chance that it, a vertically polarized light will pass through 45 degree angle. Now, once it passes through 45, it collapses to 45. Now, 45 degree can be written as 1 by root 2 times passing through horizontal plus 1 by root 2 times passing through vertical. So, uh, so then again, 1 by root 2 square is half. So, again, 50% chance that a 45 degree polarized light will pass through horizontal. So, it is 50, 50, 50. So, 1 8 chance that photon will pass through the system exactly what we measured. And this is the superposition principle, which says if you, you can get answers in in uh, n different forms then before you measure before you measure a superposition of all the n is the reality now that gives us the following massive quantum parallelism and that's the birth of quantum computers so notice that if i have one electron in say spin up spin down or say excited state or ground state or say one one photon in which is say either vertically polarized or horizontally polarized right so notice that there are two possible outcomes in a qubit. So we said you need two complex numbers to describe it, where mod uh, a square and is the probability of first outcome, mod b square is probability of second outcome. Suppose you have two electrons. Each one can be spin up or spin down. Then there are four possible outcomes. It can be up, 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 down, down, up, or down, down. Therefore, you need four complex numbers to describe this, where the uh, mod a square will tell you the probability of up up, mod b square will tell you probability of up down, mod c square will tell you probability of down up, and mod d square will tell you probability of down down. So if you have a three qubit system, you need eight complex numbers to describe the system because there are eight possible outcomes and the superposition of all the eight is the initial reality and before you measure and there will be some probability distribution according to the amplitude squares to tell you what is the distribution. But then you need eight complex numbers in general to describe a three qubit system. Now, if you have a n qubit system, then you need two power n complex numbers to describe it, which means, so in Feynman's words, nature is bookkeeping two power n complex numbers to evolve a n qubit system. Now, notice that if you have a mole of hydrogen, each hydrogen has one electron, that electron can be spin up or spin down. And therefore, before I measure, a mole of Hydrogen has 2 to the power 6.023 to 10 to the power 23 electrons. And therefore, before you measure the total superposition, requires 2 to the power 6.023 to the 10 to the power 23. So, order of 2 power 10 to the power 23 complex numbers are required to be book kept in one mole of hydrogen. So, so in one mole of, uh, in that volume, we do not know how to store so many complex numbers, but nature keeps, uh, not only keeps, Track of these complex numbers, but but actually behaves and uh, and uh, evolves as per this, and and uh, you should solve the Schrodinger equation on this also at the end. So so nature seems to solve Schrodinger equation on these many complex amplitudes, uh, and therefore nature seems to do so exponentially more powerful tasks than what we can think of. In case you are able to pose your problem in that form in which nature is doing the computation, the nature will do the computation and give the answer for you. And uh, what takes, uh, say, 2 to power 10 to power 23 complex numbers and takes billions of years for you to compute, one mole of hydrogen will compute that for you and give you. So, so, so if you want to solve Schrodinger equation in one mole of hydrogen, notice that current computer will give you the answer after billions of years, if at all, whereas uh, nature does it in real time. So, so notice that uh, that is the uh, birth of quantum computers, but for us, we are more interested in something even more interesting because of the superposition. This is called quantum entanglement. So suppose you have a system of 1 by root 2 times 0, 0 plus 1, 1. So it's a two qubit system. Of the four possibilities, I'm saying half chance for 0, 0, half chance for a 1, 1, 0 chance for other two. Then once you 
have say two electrons up spin up up and spin down down and are 50 50 chance each there is no chance of spin down uh, up and down down let us say then notice see, then see what happens if i measure the spin of the first electron then the se second electron automatically collapses to the same answer that the first electron gives now the fact that this can happen even if the second electron was very far away from the first is what disturbed Einstein to say that something is wrong in quantum mechanics. God does not play dice. But the modern experiment suggests that, in fact, there is spooky action at a distance. If I have two electrons and and they are synthesized to be uh, one by two times uh, zero, zero, and one, one, they so spin up, up, and down, down. They, and I once you synthesize these two and one electron is taken to very far off location, say to Mars, to Jupiter, wherever. And then I, I measure the first electron. It turns out that uh, at least uh, at much, much faster than speed of light, there is almost instantaneous collapse in the other electron too. So there's a famous experiment in 1982 by aspects and replicated many different, uh, in many different ways till date, where, where you can see that the collapse happens even though uh, no light could have traveled or no effect could have traveled faster than the speed of light from one look, one of the electron to another, they are so far apart that that uh, when they were measured with a gap of say uh, very few uh, milliseconds, uh, the distance between those two electrons were, were much larger than the time it takes for light to go from one to another. Yet, even though they are causally separate, they, it turned out that the uh, the answers were always the same and therefore the spooky action at a distance is a uh, fallout of quantum superposition and it actually gives much more bizarre uh, applications like quantum teleportation dense coding so there are many many bizarre applications of of the spooky action at a distance one such application is quantum bison agreement or uh, is what we are going to see so quantum consensus for blockchains so we look at for the case where one out of three is uh, corrupt, uh, where standard uh, distributed computing does not work, but this can this can work for other things also. And let us see one such solution for blockchain. So suppose instead of three ele uh, two electrons, I build three electrons. This is called a GZ state. So uh, this is one by root two times zero 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 plus one by root two times one one one. So fifty percent chance. I am just dropping the coefficient because if you assume uniform coefficient, there are only Two possibilities, each one should have 50 prob 50 percent probability square root of half is one by root two. So, so that's fine. So, so there is 50 percent chance of a 0, 0, 0, 50 percent chance of a 1, 1, 1, and other six possibilities, because total there are eight possibilities, other six possibilities have zero zero probability, right? So if you use such a state and I I give first qubit to A, second one to B, and third one to C, and if we Alice measures first qubit, say zero. Automatically, we know no matter how far away B and C are, so B and C also will start to measure zero. And of course, if if Alice measures one, B and C also will will measure one. And therefore, if if there are two chains zero and one, nature can be the trusted authority to choose. So, so we can agree by nature's choice. So we ask uh, uh, we ask one of the participants to measure their qubit automatically the answer of everybody will match with, with that answer. So it's equivalent to saying nature has chosen zero or one. And based on that, uh, you can you can choose the chain named zero or chain named one as the correct chain, right? So uh, to conclude, so we saw what is the blockchain approach. Then we saw uh, uh, like what is the future uh, using quantum mechanics. Now we'll see what are the future problems that can be tamed. So notice that eff effectively the technique is the following. Uh, if the main objective is agreement, the fundamental technique of blockchain is simply the following. Create a chain of information of some kind and you have uh, deemed to have agreed to the longest chain of information, provided the four properties are there. Appending information to the chain is randomized, monopoly is not there. Appointing to the longest chain is rewarded. Appointing elsewhere is penalized, and the chain is append only. So you, you cannot do anything else other than append. So how does say how do how does Bitcoin work? Bitcoin makes the chain append only by hash chaining. 
it may increase penalty by proof of work uh, it uh, rewards by giving uh, uh, say transaction fees or uh, free bitcoins to the person who, who adds and there is randomization by saying the first person who solves the hash puzzle gets the opportunity and automatically you can get agreement on the longest chain of information this technique uh, helps to achieve banking without a banker in the future same style of techniques but uh, different uh, implementations and instantiations will will give you different solutions other than banking without a banker you can take decisions without a decider uh, using the same technique because if you can do banking without a banker why can't you do this maybe this is tougher but I will give you enough reasons in the next slide to show that even though it is tougher, it can be done. So you can probably create stories without a story writer. You can make discoveries without a scientist. You can prove theorems without a prover. You can uh, do inventions without the inventor. You can de decentralize almost everything. So, so what gives us the confidence in saying that we can do all this? The confidence comes from the fact that some the uh, banking without a banker is already done and something that is tougher than all of these is also already done. So, uh, so banking without a banker may be easier than this that is done. There is something that is tougher than all of this that is also done. We'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Therefore, sandwich between the easiest of the things like block, blockchain for banking and toughest of the things that you are going to talk about is sandwich between these two. All these also should be possible. Uh, one fine day, some people will start to instantiate all of this also. So what is the thing that that I was talking about? The toughest thing that that has uh, already been done. Can we evolve creatures without a creator? So how do you evolve creatures without a creator? So all you need to do is make the creatures agree on the longest chain and ensure that it is an up and only chain and ensure that adding to the longest chain is rewarded. Ensure that adding elsewhere elsewhere is penalized and ensure there is enough randomness that there is no monopoly involved. So how, how do you do this? So if you have heard of Darwin's theory of evolution, you can see that uh, no DNA has a monopoly. There is always some, some amount of randomness to avoid monopoly, there, there is mutation. So randomness meets, there is penalty for, for uh, not being in the longest chain. What is the longest chain? Longest chain is the DNA that survives the longest, the survival of the fittest. So, so uh, if what is uh, the penalty for not being in the longest chain? Say so you're not fit enough, so you you may die. So death, uh, uh, carnivores, predators. So there are there are many ways in which there is penalty for not being fit. So there is reward for being fit. So what what is reward? Every, every creature wants to pass on its DNA to its progeny. So it, it is done by chemistry, hormones, uh, pleasure, so several things involved. So there is incentive for for uh, uh, progeny, so incentive for adding to the longest chain, there is penalty for not being fit, so there is penalty for not being in the longest chain, there is randomness involved, no, no DNA has any uh, monopoly in the system, and it is up and only. So you, you, you cannot go back in time and, and uh, add something in the middle. So, so notice that if time travel were possible, then, then this could create issues with evolution also, but since it, we are not found with the time travel is possible, not worry. So it is happened only because time travel is not possible. It is having all the other properties of of getting uh, the the uh, agreement, and therefore it is able to evolve creatures without a creator. Now, when you when you can do banking without a banker using bitcoins, when you can evolve creatures without a creator using theory of uh, evolution, why can't you do everything else in the world? So I'll stop with that saying that you can just do anything without the doer because all you need is uh, ensure that you have an up and only chain of information and agree on the longest one by having penalty for adding in the wrong place, reward for adding in the right place and enough randomness to avoid monopoly. Thank you. So with this, I stop for questions. Thank you, sir. Questions? Good morning, sir. I'm Ram Chandran here. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, 
representing a fantastic thought process from blockchain and then to the evolution of the mankind or the world. At last we completed where we start or where we end. And it was a thought provoking uh, presentation. We thought it will be a blockchain thing and finally you brought it to the futuristic approach with quantum mechanics and uh, quantum computing and quantum information and quantum entanglement. Uh, it, it, this two hours time is not enough for uh, really understanding uh, what uh, is there, but the basic uh, thoughts which were going through our mind, where we came from and uh, who is the creator, uh, you, have, you, have, you have told an answer in that. If you go deep inside that, we can uh, get an answer. But uh, it was a nice uh, thing. There is no question. If, if at all we ask question, we have to ask ourselves and uh, solve it. You have to listen to your speech uh, another uh, three times and only we will be able to evolve. I think uh, it was a very, very interesting topic to, uh, I was happy to be part of this uh, program. We will meet you thank later, you. sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Very good, sir. Yeah, as you said, uh, yeah, questions if you have, the best answers will come from, from within only. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, sir, one question which with respect to your uh, talk, uh, the proof of uh, work you were explaining that uh, whenever uh, a person is uh, given a puzzle, uh, generally any general person nowadays we are asking, I am a layman to this uh, blockchain system, I am not a computer scientist or a computer science uh, graduate. So what is that puzzle and what you are, you are, you are telling very clearly there, if you can once yeah, more give that. that puzzle you know. is, so notice that in the hash chain, the hash of the uh, previous block has to be stored in the next block. Now the puzzle is, Find out what modifications you will do in the previous block, modifications to, to some additional randomness only, not to the transactions. What modifications you will do to the additional randomness in the previous block, such that the hash value becomes less than a threshold value. So, so for instance, if you use SHA-1, the output is a 160-bit number. Now, suppose I say the output should not be a 160-bit number, it should be a 130-bit number. That is, it should start with 30 zeros. Then, notice that I have no idea of what changes I have to make to the nonce so that I get this. So I should keep trying one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. Notice that by the time I try about two or 30 times or so, I am, I am expected to actually by, by fluke hit up on one such answer. So that is the hash puzzle. So you, if you actually solve that hash puzzle, the hash puzzle is get me that nonce such that the hash of the overall block is is starting with 30 zeros. So so that is the puzzle. So can you can you get me the the randomness that needs to be appended to the previous block such that the overall hash value starts with 30 zeros. So whether it's 30 zeros or 29 or 28 depends on the total computational power that is there now. That, that is the hardness of the puzzle. I am just giving example of 30 zeros. So that's the threshold. So so notice that for different values, the hash values will be different. So what what should be the uh, nonce to be appointed so that the hash value will have a value uh, starting with 30 zeros at least is the, is the puzzle. Now uh, to solve this puzzle, I, I don't have, because hashing is going to give random answers, I have no idea what to add. So I need to do a brute force search. And uh, to do the brute force search, I have to do a lot of work. And that becomes proof of work. And randomness comes from the fact that the first person who does it will be will will not, will not be known before. Cool. So it, it basically, this. your computing power. You should have a bigger uh, computer so that yeah. uh, you'll be able to find the random number. This random yeah. puzzle is not given by somebody. It's chosen on our own based on the previous hash. Correct. Yes. So you uh, every, anybody can look at the current what is the uh, current uh, block that is being mined. Everybody will have this, this previous block definition. Different people could have different definitions based on the ge geographic location, but that's no problem. They are free to add to uh, to the uh, whatever they they saw as the previous block. They are free to add the next block there. As long as that is going to become the longest, that will you will get the reward. So 
uh, you just look at the current state of the of the chain of the system pick the let, uh, latest block that is there and that becomes your previous block hash of uh, 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 that uh, you will be stored in the next block you store the hash of that to the next block you add the nonce so that the hash of the next block becomes i mean the new block becomes less than the threshold that is the idea who will who will add this nonce is it a computer randomly putting that nonce or is any anybody is involved in that the person who's doing that is called the miner but anybody anybody can become the miner any computer can become the miner even your mobile phone can become the miner if it can solve it but you are telling the variable is nonce that nonce is, is also nonce selected has to be by... chosen nonce has to nonce has to be solved for it has to be chosen by by your computer such that the hash of of the block that you are mining becomes less than the threshold okay thank you sir so, so uh, the uh, block will have a lot of transactions so by fluke if the hash of the transactions with all nonce as zero itself give is less than the threshold by fluke you need you, you can stop otherwise you have to keep changing the nonce that will keep changing the hash you have to continue this change of the nonce till the time that the hash value has is less than the threshold okay good i have to change my nonce to get a value less than 2 to the power of 30 it depends on so sha2 is a sha2 output is 256 so so probably 2 to the power of 2 220 so so that number 